for those who are already on, we're uh, still just waiting another minute or so to give a chance for other people to get on, but we don't want to start too late because we've got an information pack presentation here from uh, two fantastic experts. I think I'll, I'll launch in just with some introductory comments. First of all, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar. What is childhood apraxia of speech, CAS, and how do we treat it? Uh, this webinar is part of the Simon Searchlight Rare Disease webinar series. My name is Paul Wong. I'm trained as a pediatrician and I'm a senior clinical research scientist at Safari, the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative. Uh, and I have the pleasure of being the moderator for today's webinar. Hopefully you can all see and hear me on your screen. We cannot see or hear you, but we do wanna make sure that the session is interactive by taking questions from you in the Zoom Q&A feature. Hopefully you can see that at the bottom of your screen, sort of in the middle, to uh, conversation bubbles, text bubbles uh, with the label Q&A underneath it. And time permitting, we will uh, read out some of those questions at the end of the presentations. I want to give you a brief overview of Simon Searchlight and its mission. For those of you who don't know, uh, Simon Searchlight is an online international research program uh, building an ever-growing natural history database and biorepository uh, and resource network for over 175 rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, by joining the Searchlight community and sharing your experiences, you are contributing to the growing database that's used by scientists worldwide to advance the understanding of these conditions. Uh, through online surveys and optional blood sample collection, we gather valuable information that we hope will improve the lives uh, of the participant families uh, and drive scientific progress. Families like yours are the key to making that meaningful progress. You can learn more by visiting our website at Simon's Searchlight, that's all one word, uh, and it's Simon's with an S on the end and then Searchlight, so there are two S's in a row, uh, .org. Uh, the team's also here to help you along each step of the way and you can contact them through the website as well. Now I wanna move on to introducing our, our speakers for today. Uh, and as I said, we have the pleasure of two truly expert uh, speakers. Uh, first, you'll be hearing from Dr. Angela Morgan. Uh, Dr. Morgan is the NHMRC Dame Elizabeth Blackburn Fellow at Murdoch Children's Research Institute, which is in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Dr. Morgan is also the Dame Kate Campbell Professional Professorial Fellow, excuse me, uh, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she's director of the NHMRC Center of Research Excellence, Translational Center for Speech Disorders, uh, which builds on a previous Center for Excellence in Speech and Language, which she had also led. Uh, she also leads the Speech and Language Group at Murdoch Children's Research Institute. She has over 26 years of clinical research experience across Australia uh, and the United Kingdom, and has come as well to the United States to contribute to research efforts here. Uh, after Dr. Morgan finishes, you'll hear from Dr. Ruth Stuckel. Uh, Dr. Stuckel has recently retired from the Mayo Clinic up in Rochester, Minnesota, where she specialized in the assessment and intervention of children with apraxia of speech, today's topic. Uh, with 30 years of experience, Dr. Stuckel has delivered services to children in various settings, in schools, in outpatient clinics, and in rehabilitation hospital settings. Um, she was consulted very often for second opinions on CAS diagnosis, prognosis, uh, and treatment. Uh, she has presented lectures, workshops, and advanced training on childhood apraxia of speech on an international level, uh, including in the US, Canada, Europe, and Australia as well. Dr. Stuckel has also authored and delivered uh, numerous web-based courses focused on CAS, and she has co-authored articles on CAS assessment and treatment in numerous peer-reviewed journals. She's a member of the Professional Advisory Council as well of Apraxia Kids. So we're honored to have both Dr. Morgan and Dr. Suckle on, on deck today. Uh, by the end of this webinar, we hope you'll have a better sense of what CAS is uh, and how it should be treated. Uh, so I'll turn it over now uh, to you, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Suckle. Thank you so much. Um... Dr. Wang, and um, and we've got yeah Dr. Stuckel here as well. Um, that was a very lovely introduction, Ruth. I'm sure you're thinking the same as we. We should we should write less when we share information with Paul because now everyone knows uh, 
it's a lot of information about us. Very lovely introduction. Um, and of course, we should do our disclosures. So I think Paul's already mentioned the roles that I hold. Um, and so I'm actually employed by the University of Melbourne, as well as the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. But my other roles are all non-financial roles. Um, and I should also mention that I am also on the Professional Advisory Council for Apraxia Kids as well, which Dr. Stuckel had, had just mentioned. So it's lovely to have um, a group of families here. And um, the first place we want to start is thinking about childhood apraxia of speech, which really is such a complicated um, term and a complicated diagnosis. So I find, and I'm sure Ruth would find the same, that it sort of does really take almost a good year for our um, students of speech pathology to really understand um, what apraxia is and how apraxia is different from other conditions. And it is still um, a, a diagnosis that I've been in the field now for over 25 years and it's still um, such a, an area where I think we could continue to improve our understanding. And really what we need to work on is um, improving how we communicate what apraxia is to families. So please do push us and ask more questions around this um, if you feel that the definition of apraxia we talk about today still isn't clear to you because I would love your feedback and um, that's what we're really striving to do is, is to really make sure we explain exactly what apraxia is here today for you. So the main um, way in which apraxia is described in our field is we would call it a brain-based or a neurologically based um, speech disorder. We know now, just in the last few years, we've really discovered that about one in three children um, have a genetic form of apraxia of speech, or rather their apraxia is caused through having a single gene or a chromosomal condition. And, and most of you today who have joined us, I'm sure that is the case for um, your children, that they have apraxia, which is associated with an underlying genetic condition. For two in three children at the moment, we are unable to identify an exact etiology. So for those children, we often say it's called idiopathic, just an unknown um, apraxia of speech. And there, really apraxia is called a, a condition where we have delayed um, spatiotemporal planning and programming, but that's a very again, um, complicated term. Um, so I think a, a nice way to um, think about apraxia is that the child knows what they want to say, but they can't plan and program the movements they need for speech. Um, and that then ends up in problems with sequencing sounds, um, the production of sounds. And something we'll talk about again soon is the prosody or the stress of sounds as well. How many children experience apraxia? Well, if you take a group of children in a clinic, so children that have been referred to a speech clinic, the rate is around three to 4%. But if we think about children in the general population, um, it's really only about one to two children per thousand children. So if you think about apraxia in that way, we know that it is really um, quite a rare speech condition. Incre increasingly, however, it does feel that with greater awareness of what apraxia is, um, there have, has been a little bit of debate here in Australia around how accurate um, our prevalence figures are, but that's more of an academic exercise. And just to let you know, we don't have fantastic data in this way. Um, so our best estimates are really that it's around one to two children per thousand. And Ruth might tell us more about what might be happening in the American context in that way um, when she speaks to us in a moment. I think the nicest way to think about what apraxia is is to start breaking it down into the three core features. So the American Speech and Hearing Association a number of years ago brought together a consensus panel of experts, including Dr. Stuckel here, to determine what are the core clinical criteria. So when families go to see their speech pathologist, what are they looking for to be able to diagnose a child with apraxia? And one of the core features that you may have experienced with your own child 
is said to be this inconsistency of speech production. So often you'll hear families say, oh, he used that word once and I just haven't heard it again. So there's that level of um, inconsistency. But of course, when a clinician is doing a test, we then try and measure that um, in one session. So one of the tools we use, we might ask a child to say the same word a number of times. And then we'll ask them to say a number of words a number of times and look at the percentage of times a child makes the word in the same way. So here we just have an example of this. This is a young man who, in whom we haven't been able to identify a specific genetic condition. Um, so we say he's got an unknown um, cause for his apraxia and he's going to be saying the word umbrella three times and you'll hear his productions and you'll hear how consistent or inconsistent he is with those productions. Okay, so we could see he had three different productions there. Oh. Um, all quite different. So that's just our phonetic spelling, but you could hear him, adabawa, bawa, abawa. Okay, so really quite different um, productions for all of those um, attempts at the word umbrella. So he's a hot, he has highly inconsistent speech, and that's one of our criteria. For some of you, you may have children who are less verbal than this young man. He's relatively verbal. Um, and so for some of our children, you may only be seeing um, attempts at sort of one or so sound, uh, you can have very different um, productions of the word where you may have far less verbal um, material to measure or to work with, and we can still um, gauge a child's level of consistency or speech motor control challenges, even when children have far less verbal output. This would still be um, something that we'd be looking at, but for a child, they may really only be able to try and shape one sound or so for a word, okay? So we can still um, look at this feature in children who are far less verbal. So I've sort of cheated to give a really nice, clear example here of inconsistency, but for many of the children we work with, they would really be um, less verbal. So we've got inconsistency. Another feature, and I, I like to, um, you know, be very clear and transparent with families on the terminology we use, but then we'll break it down. Another term is lengthened or a, a diagnostic feature, lengthened and disrupted co-articulatory transitions. Now, what a mouthful, really, what a mouthful. But all this really means is what are the types of error patterns that a child is using? And really, these error patterns are very different to the sorts of patterns you might see in other more common speech um, disorders, which we'll talk about again in a moment, just to compare how is apraxia different to the more common speech disorders we see. So what is this lengthen and disrupted co-articulatory transition? Second diagnostic criteria really mean these are challenges such as vowel errors. So children with other forms of speech sound disorder, like a phonological disorder, often you'll see them... Um, substituting different sounds. So you might see um, wide for ride, a W for an R. So they're just swapping around one sound, but you won't hear vowel errors in those sorts of phonological conditions. So this is one feature in apraxia. We might see children adding sounds. Most commonly we see children omitting sounds, don't we? Having less sounds, having fewer sounds in their sound inventory. So children might take a longer time to learn all of their sounds of their sound system. Um, sometimes you can see challenges with nasality of speech as well. So there are only a few sounds um, in English, which are, we call nasal sounds, but for some children, these are very fine movement patterns you need to show oral versus nasal sounds. So you'll hear those sorts of challenges of distinction of oral and nasal sounds, many more errors per word. Sometimes you might see visible searching or struggle to produce speech sounds. So I've got a video here of a child, um, a young man who does have apraxia associated with a genetic condition, associated with a FOXP2 related condition. So FOXP2 is one of the genes that has been associated with speech disorder. Um, and you'll see this little man when he's talking, you'll see a little bit of jaw sliding or groping, attempting to produce the sound, that visible searching.
house. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a look at the next picture because we've got the target words on there. Um, so we'll listen to him again, but you could sort of see him really struggling there. And you'll see, you'll think, was he really even attempting house? But as he goes on, he does warm up a little bit and you'll hear him hitting the targets a little more closely. But you'll really see these patterns of um, using very different um, sounds to what you might be expecting, omitting sounds. Um, vowel error patterns you hear a slowness to his speech production as well he's very slow he's quite monopitch um, so the prosodic aspect which we haven't yet really spoken about and I'll talk more about in a moment but you'll hear him quite flat across his prosody or the stress of speech sounds or the sing-song pattern of our voice as we talk about that's the third feature I'll talk about in a moment but have a listen and think about that as we hear this young man Talking and what's this bit? Doll. The door. Good boy. And what's this one? A doll. A window. Look at you. You know. So yeah, very. Um... We could see there some of those um, challenges that that young man had, but very um, over the top from me <laughs> in trying to get him to feel comfortable speaking because he really um, was not comfortable to do assessments and had been um, a child who was not really happy to um, produce verbal speech in a testing session in that way. So you hear my intonation was quite over the top as well with that young man. But as you could see there, the third diagnostic feature that we talk about is really inappropriate prosody or the, if you like, the stress patterns, the um, timing of our speech, uh, the sing-song nature of our speech. So here we see the volume was quite mono loud, the pitch was quite, um, or the sing-song pattern of his voice was quite mono pitch. So sort of not a lot of variation there, um, a li little bit of a slower rate. Um, so these were some of the features that we can see in a child who has a praxis of speech. Sometimes it's also hard to hear the prosodic aspect depending on the amount of speech, a verbal speech a child may have as well. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about how apraxia is different from other speech sound disorders as well. So we sort of really highlighted earlier that apraxia occurs far less commonly than other speech sound disorders. So um, what are some of those other speech sound conditions? Well, one that you would hear about a lot is more of a, an articulation disorder, um, such as a lisp is the most common one that we hear or think about. And lisps are, and other forms of articulation disorder, um, such as a slight distortion of an er sound, um, these are very common. So we'd see these in about 5% of preschool children. We would see phonological delay or disorder as well in about 5% of preschool children. Um, so this is where children might be, again, substituting different sounds. They won't have vowel errors. Um, and really, children are still quite intelligible. Um, so with apraxia, with the inconsistency and the other features, as we know, it can be really hard for our children, for children to get their message across in phonological disorders. Um, these are very common Common patterns of development can be very typical for children to use certain pa um, patterns of um, substitution of sounds up until certain ages um, and, again, very common. And the other feature is that these conditions really um, are quite um, more efficient to treat. So children often will resolve with or without treatment by seven years, but um, this is quite a difference to um, apraxia. Then we also have stuttering. I think stuttering is something that the general public feel really comfortable in detecting. It's a little easier to describe. Stuttering is also very common in the early years, but thankfully for, for many children, it does resolve. Um, and for some, it does, it does still persist. Uh, there are a number of treatments available. They don't work for everybody, but in general, we do have some quite successful therapies for stuttering, and we do see a lot of resolution um, of stuttering over time, which is great. Um, and then 
we've got something called dysarthria that I'll spend a moment just discussing as well in a second. So along with apraxia of speech, dysarthria is also very rare, as you see here. Um, and whilst apraxia and dysarthria are responsive to therapy, and we have a absolutely a leading expert in Dr. Stuckel to talk to us about the types of therapies for speech motor disorders. They're responsive to therapy, but there's not this easy resolution. Okay, we know a lot of hard work is required for speech motor conditions to really get improvement of the system. And something else um, just to be aware of, I suppose, is that the genetics, when we've got these single gene conditions um, that we know about, um, they are associated more commonly with dysarthria and apraxia, whereas for those other speech sound disorders, they're less commonly linked um, to uh, single gene conditions or chromosomal conditions. They're said to more, have a more complicated pattern of inheritance, if you like. So just wanted to emphasise the importance of getting the right diagnosis um, of apraxia and or dysarthria. We'll go and just talk briefly about dysarthria in a moment because I wanted to emphasise that these are both disorders of speech motor control. So in apraxia, as I said, the child knows what they want to say, but it's they have real difficulty planning and programming and sequencing together the sounds and getting that correct prosody. In dysarthria, as you'll see in a moment, again, the child would know what they would like to say, but um, their movement system, they have challenge with the execution of the, of the speech sounds. So they might have problems controlling tone and coordinating all of their um, speech musculature to produce that final signal. So they, they seem probably subtle distinctions, but let's have a look again at a child with dysarthria. Um, so dysarthria, um, as I said, it's really a, a core issue where you've got muscle tone difficulties or more the control of the muscle tone, okay, which is slightly different to the child with apraxia. But often apraxia and dysarthria come together. And sometimes when children with apraxia have minimal speech, but then you start to hear the speech um, in improving in terms of the amount of verbal speech that a child uses, then you might hear more of a dysarthric overlay. That's something we often see. So we'll have a listen to this young lady. Again, it's a young lady who has a genetic condition and she does have some features of apraxia, but here we can more see um, the dysarthria profile for her. So you could hear there, she has quite a tremulous um, voice. Um, she does have challenges with tone and with being able to sit easily at rest. Um, she has a fluctuating tone pattern. So as she's talking, you can hear the valving and the challenges of her um, speech musculature system in being able to produce her speech. She also has a, um, some apraxic errors or errors making her speech less intelligible. But what I wanted to show was this issue, if you like, of, of valving or being able to produce um, speech clearly there. So some of the issues you see are challenges um, really with the control of the tone um, or, or execution of movement across the speech subsystems, if you like. So the sorts of, when we mean subsystems, what do we mean? We're talking about your voice, um, the ability to control your voice, whether you have enough breath support for speech. So you'll find for some children, um, they really have challenges with being able to um, produce more than even one word on a breath stream. So they might have to breathe in constantly to be able to produce enough speech on each breath stream. For some children, there's um, excessive nasal resonance all of the time or not enough nasal resonance. So there's, again, problems with controlling um, oral nasal resonance due to difficulty with um, control of the soft palate at the back of our um, throat, which really helps us to control um, oral nasal sounds. But that's probably going a little bit more than what you'd like to hear about this afternoon. But we're ha really happy to talk further about some of these issues. Distortion, so just through um, challenges of articulatory control and tone, um, just imprecision of your speech sounds as well. 
issues with speech rate. So when it's so effortful um, to control your muscle tone and produce speech, often we'll see slower rate more often in children. And then again, you can have challenges with pitch variation and loudness. So some of those features do really overlap with how we think about apraxia, but you're needing to look at all of the speech sound features to make that really clear differential diagnosis. And I think importantly, often these conditions do co-occur, um, including in our genetic conditions very much so. So we know that um, for many years, we spent a lot of time refining the symptomatology, working out how to diagnose apraxia and dysarthria. Then we had the first gene associated with apraxia of speech, FOXP2, um, was identified where spelling errors, if you like, in that gene were linked to apraxia of speech. Um, and then since that time, just most recently, because of advances in genetic technology, which your families will be really well aware of, we've been able to identify many more more genetic conditions that are associated with apraxia of speech, which is really exciting and good for us to be able to start understanding more about the neurobiology or how when a gene is um, affected, what the flow on effect is in terms of our um, neural development, brain development, development of the regions of the brain that support our speech function, and then thinking about the most targeted precise therapies for our children based on that new knowledge that we have around the gene pathways that might be affected to cause apraxia for us. So I just wanted to give a little plug that um, there are some great speech pathology academics that we're all training now, Dr. Stuckel and others in the US, um, some here in Australia, in the UK, we're really trying to help get speech and language challenges recognised for different genetic conditions and in our NIH guidelines so that when families do attend an appointment, um, you know, this is recognised and in helping you access funding and services as well. And of course, uh, we hope this will then help um, clinicians in terms of thinking about referral for children who have speech and language difficulties um, for genetic diagnoses. And then also in our team, um, working together with all of the wonderful, this is just an example of a few, we've got many, many more, and of course the wonderful Simon Searchlight Foundation who greatly support so many um, genetic conditions, so many families, um, that what we're trying to do is we've got a website and a resource where we are producing then um, fact sheets and information about how the specific genetic conditions might affect speech, including um, apraxia. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, this is just an example of sorts of questions we have under some of the genes on our website um, in case that's helpful for people. But you're, what you really want to know and what you really want to hear is from Dr. Stuckel about exactly how do we um, treat apraxia of speech. So thank you so much, Ruth. I'll stop sharing my slides and it'll be fantastic to hear from you now. All right. Let's um, bring up what I've got. Um, all right, can everyone see? It looks like this should work. Yes, got it. Um, I'm so glad to be here and thankful for the opportunity to talk to you um, and to sort of piggyback on Dr. Morgan's wonderful talk. So in talking about treatment, the question is, how should we treat childhood apraxia of speech or knowing that um, dysarthria can occur, a, a childhood motor speech disorder? So in a very short amount of time, I'm going to touch a little bit on the best therapy options for apraxia, um, talk a little bit about the ideal dose, which we are still trying to figure out, and um, really to understand as we learn more and have more genetic information to guide us that individually tailored therapy is truly the key for uh, working with these children and your children. So as, as clinicians, um, I have been interested certainly in the, the research and the, 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 what you would call um, laboratory-based um, information that can provide some information to translate it to clinical practice. So as clinicians, we're providing intervention based on that child's presentation. That is, what does that child look like who's before me? 
We know that there's a range of severity in how a genetic condition can be expressed. And we know that there's a range of severity for a motor speech disorder. And so we've got quite a broad spectrum to look at and decide, you know, what is this particular child's presentation like and how is that going to inform our treatment. So just knowing the name of the genetic condition or name, knowing the name of the motor speech disorder is not enough. We have to see that unique individual child. So the, the thing that we know is that having that etiology defined can make it easier to predict what might be happening later on or and to provide more efficient therapy because we understand what we might want to expect down the road in terms of the speed of intervention or what additional aspects we might need to add to intervention for this child based on their presentation. So when we're looking at intervention, um, we think about a breakdown in the child's ability to communicate and how that affects the child, both at home and in the community. I've been really excited and a little bit sad to give up clinical practice because we are finally getting to a point in our profession where we're thinking outside of the therapy room. So how can we make this child communicate more effectively, not just in the therapy session, but out in the world? So we're, we're thinking about a lot more things. Um, where there might be a breakdown in their ability to communicate, we must look at that child's ability to cognitively form a message, to show some intent, <clears throat> And that doesn't mean they need to have words, but to be pointing, to be grunting, to be trying to convey a message using behaviors to indicate something they like or something they don't like. So we, we want to see that they're trying to convey something to you. That is a very basic level. If a child has no intent to communicate, it's much more difficult to teach them how to communicate. So then as we get to a, a linguistic level, a language level, we're thinking about can that child pull up words from their vocabulary in some way through gesture, again, um, gestures, pictures, devices, or words, and can they put them together to form a simple sentence? Um, and they need to have those sound patterns in their repertoire or some way of expressing those words in a way that people can understand intelligibly. And then, as Dr. Morgan talked about, we have apraxia and dysarthria at the level of motor processing, which is movement planning and programming for apraxia. We're, we're trying to say a word, but we can't quite get all those neurons to fire in synchrony so that we can produce what we want. And we have um, accidental movements and difficulty forming the, the sequences we want where with um, dysarthria, the execution of movement, we know what we want to say and how to say it, but there's a little weakness in some of the subsystems, say respiration, you're not breathing efficiently enough or you're not producing the, the sequences that you want with enough force. So we have both of those things that can be happening for children at that level. So just a very quick look at it in a little more um, concrete ways. For apraxia, you've got that planning and programming going on, but oh, the arrow's going kind of the wrong way. Oh, it's coming out here. And we say, ah, and as you saw with that little boy, the next attempt might be up, -a, and the next attempt might be up. And all of these are for out, so none of them are correct, and they're all very different because that child is struggling to coordinate the articulators and use the motor planning and programming to produce that target. The difference with dysarthria in execution is that that child might get that message down to their articulators, but it's a little bit weak, ah, instead of out. Then we try again, use a little more force, out. They're getting better. Try it even with a little more force and it might come out as out. So you can see that there's some recognizable aspect to the word and that a little more effort can make a difference because they're able to overcome that weakness or that, that imprecision and um, make it more clear. So that's, a you know, the execution is the piece rather than the planning and programming. Those are the levels of breakdown. Then the... The other thing that's been really exciting in the last number of years in our profession is that we're all thinking about beyond the, the therapy room. In speech pathology, we learn to look at body structures and function, which are thinking about the anatomy that the child has, 
their functional ability to produce sounds and again, motor planning and execution. But we're also beginning to think about activities and participation. Parents want to know, will my child be okay when they go to nursery school? Can they tell an adult when something goes wrong and they're afraid or hurt or happy? Um, can they engage in the community? Can they order their own ice cream at the ice cream stand? So we're beginning to try and put those things together that we talk about teaching intelligibility, but with the focus on how is that intelligibility going to help that child function more outside of the therapy room? And then we also have to be aware of environmental factors, what, what resources the family has access to, and including intervention, but also technology and support from their community. And then particularly with children for whom we know there is a genetic basis or a genetic condition, we need to be thinking about, do they have vision difficulty or hearing difficulty? Do they have cognitive delays? so that we can be aware of how we need to be planning our intervention to accommodate those additional issues or seeing those issues as primary and using our therapy to produce uh, communication within the context of that larger difficulty that they have. So in our intervention, the primary thing is communication. We want to help that child participate in the world and we have to understand their capacity and give them the, the, the confidence to do some risk taking when we know they have some co-occurring issues and might be a little bit nervous, but we also want to improve function. So we're, we're trying to help them produce more intelligible, which is not always perfect speech, but intelligible. And so we're thinking about where is the greatest influence on that child's intelligibility or um, ability to communicate, <coughs> excuse me. So one thing I talk with parents, particularly who have children with known genetic conditions that make it less likely that they'll be verbal very early, we want to be able to use augmentative and alternative communication to build that understanding that I can control my environment when I have a way to express myself. And that might be, I'm going to learn some simple signs. I'm going to use some pictures. I'm going to combine these methods to be the most effective communicator that I can be. And I've had um, interactions with parents where it takes a while to build trust, but I will tell them, this is not going to slow down your child's communication. And the research we have suggests that you, if you use other modes of communication early on when the child is less verbal, those children will become more verbal than the children who are working only on speech skills from the very beginning. And when you think about it, here I am waving my hands, we all use multiple modes of communication. So we don't want to hold back on anything that might help that child and give them, again, that ability to take risks or the willingness to take risks and to be more effective, independent of someone else communicating for them. So is therapy different when we have children with a genetic condition? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because we're accommodating aspects of that child's development that might be affected by the genetic condition. Again, thinking about their fine and gross motor skills, their hearing, their vision, their sensory sensitivities, all of those things. But for the speech part, the basics of motor-based speech therapy will apply. So we're going to adapt our treatment in motor-based therapy for this particular child with an understanding of how the genetic condition is expressed and how their speech is expressed. <coughs> oh. <clears throat> Apologies for that. So what we want to do in motor-based intervention is to practice sequences of movement. I think of movements rather than sounds. And as Dr. Morgan said, the spatio-temporal parameters, we love those big long words, but what it means is we're moving at the right time, in the right direction, with the right amount of force to get that articulator to the right place at the right time and produce the sequence so that people can understand you. And when I see clinicians working with apraxia who are saying, well, we're working all the B words and all the P words or all the M words, um, this is an example I like, and so hopefully you will practice this at home, even though we can't see you. 
but I want you to just place your mouth and say, moo. Now say it with great force, moo. What do you notice happening to your lips? They're becoming more round as getting ready for that O, oh, for the moo. Now say me and say it with great force and then stop on the A, me. Your lips are retracted more, you're smiling more. So these are M's, but they're not all the same. And so these effects of having a vowel before or after or another consonant before or after, they interfere with the, or they don't interfere with, but they influence the actual production of that target. So you're going to need some fine motor adjustments. So rather than trying to teach all of the M words at a time, we're gonna think about teaching some functional words that have this particular movement gesture in it and get really good at it. So as the child over time becomes more flexible in their ability to adapt that movement or the other sounds that are around it in something new that they're trying to say. And this is very difficult for, you know, I grew up in the traditional learning to teach a lisp and learning to teach S's and R's and L's. And this is a very different model that we're thinking about when we think about motor therapy. <laughs> if there's weakness, will exercises help to strengthen? No, that's the short answer. We don't produce speech as one movement at a time. They're always sequences of movements. Babies begin to babble in what we can call canon canonical syllables. They're putting syllables together, sequencing sounds. And we know that brain activation is different for the different use of their oral muscles for eating versus speaking. We know that language ability affects speech motor control. The more complex your language is, the more likely you are to have some difficulty. You know, I've stumbled over a few words already trying to be formulating and producing linguistically complex sentences. So then training in context is the other thing. You know, we expect to learn to do something in the context that is going to be used will have the most impact. So we're focusing on motor learning, thinking about movement patterns, we're thinking about generalization. And what we have to understand is that a child can do something therapy that they're not going to do at home because I'm the teacher and I have expectations and parents are going to love their child, even if they're imperfect. And so we have to carefully transition from the therapy room to outside of the therapy room, understanding that practice in the therapy room is not the same as having learned the skill to use it all of the time and to have realistic expectations. So as analogies, we have batting practice where this little boy is getting assistance to hit the ball on the tee. The, the learning is taking it to a baseball game where the conditions are different. There are more children around. You're going to run to the bases. It's going to make a difference how well you hit the ball and such. So that's transferring the learning from the practice to the real life. And so the same thing is speech therapy in the room to communication with peers and parents and other people. To do this, and I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things at you, so buckle up your seatbelts and you know um, you can get the notes downloaded later to think about it some more, that principles of motor learning are based on what we learned in limb work, but we're learning more all the time about how this applies to motor speech disorders too. And, and we think about it, the, the younger children are going to have, need more support in more different ways. And the older children might need less support or be able to take feedback that, you know, can you fix it rather than being helped to fix it? So the principles just talk about how much practice do you need? And we know from the research we have on speech that more practice is better at first to establish some proficiency before you're going to try it somewhere else. How are we going to practice targets? Many times in a row can be very helpful versus spread out over a session. In my sessions, I very often would start teaching hi and bye so the child could come in the room and we could say hi, let's say that really clearly. And then at the end of a session say bye. And so those targets were spread out over sessions as the child became proficient. Um, and we're organizing our practice that way so that we can practice a lot at first and then build them into fewer, um, productions over a greater amount of time. So we're thinking about all these things and it's it's quite complex. So I don't want to um, stress you out by having you say, oh, I need to know all these things. These are the kinds of things you want to be looking for though in, in a 
good motor-based therapy that they're thinking about practice scheduling and practice frequency and even what type of feedback. We know younger children need more feedback for a longer amount of time to build the confidence to keep working. When we talk about targets, we wanna think about variety. So again, if you think the moo and me and my, why don't we work on mom and go because those are going to be different movement sequences that have high relevance in that child's life. And then they can be working on that lips closed to a vowel motion versus the tongue raised in the back to a vowel motion. You're teaching more motion, more movements and therefore hopefully being more efficient. And then you begin to build your syllables into a series. So once I have hi and mom, I might start teaching hi mom and it's amazing how that child is going to struggle to go from the single word to putting those two together that we thought they knew how to say. So being cognizant of as we increase complexity, providing the support they need. So we wanna promote early success by helping the child to say something that are fairly easy so that they build that um, risk-taking behavior. Um, if we keep saying, try it again, try it again, try it again, and the child can't say it, everyone gets frustrated. So that's not helpful. So a real quick run through. Um, the So what are the treatments? These are treatments that have some research-based evidence for children with apraxia, but they're uh, most appropriate at different times. DTTC is most appropriate for younger, more severe children. Rapid syllable transition rest is more appropriate for older children who are uh, more verbal. So when you ask about what are the, the best interventions, it depends on the age and the severity of what the child is doing. The integrated phonological awareness is a good support because we know that children with apraxia are going to need some assistance with um, literacy or more likely to. Here are some other um, interventions that also have some research basis. And then when we talk about dysarthria, we work on different things in dysarthria. So we have of motor learning, they both might need augmentative communication. We're looking at that child's overall abilities and the differences are that for apraxia, we're applying these principles to getting more accurate. If we are working with a child with dysarthria, we're trying to help that child get more respiratory support perhaps. So we're focusing on, can you produce a sequence? Um, Here's a little guy with one of the more common genetic syndromes, trisomy 21. Early in therapy, he is primarily apraxic. We worked on want more to get some little people to go on a bus. And we were transitioning because he could do the want to say bus, because he's got that lips closed movement gesture, right? Um, and this little guy actually had quite a large sign vocabulary. So um, we were trying to transition Dr. Stuckel, I don't know if we're going to Not more this time. Bus. Smile. Bus. Oh, you're trying so hard. One more time. Want. Start with the Want. And then close your lips. Bus. Bus. Oh, you're trying so hard. Look at this. Oh, whoops, you can see, you know, he's struggling. He cannot, he, he can say more, but he can't say less. So why can't we say these simple lips closed to a vowel gesture because they're different motorically. So over time, he Let's get this. Developed, developed more um, motor control and his breath support and voice quality became more prominent. I want the orange. Oh. Say the whole thing. Uh, want. I want the black this. Nice. I want the orange, oh. please. Oh. You got it. Stick it in. Now I have an apple. I want apple. 
Ooh. Can you say, I want the apple, please? That was good. Let's get the other word in. Uh, I want, want the e apple. E so you can see he's uh, taking a breath between each word, and it took a lot of work to get just two or three words um, together in a sequence and to keep them accurate. Um, with as much intelligibility as possible. We didn't go for perfection because with the dysarthria, it was more important to make it want... as intelligible as possible rather than getting perfection. So what's the best therapy? We're still trying to decide. And what's the best amount? We're also still trying to decide. decide. There are studies underway to help define the optimal number of sessions per week. And again, it depends, depends on the child's developmental abilities and the expression of their genetic condition and the expression of their speech disorder. So um, there is no single answer that's right, which I apologize for, but we're working on it. We really are. Um, bilingual families should not be afraid to try the language that is spoken in the home or that is spoken in their community, as well as working on uh, the language of the community. Um, caregivers are part of the team, so ask your therapist for guidance. We really need to be a team. And um, parents are often surprised when I say just reading to your child or singing together. And if we are intentional about how we're doing these things, they can be fun, but they can also be helping your child make progress. Um, but it's, again, helpful to do it in conjunction with your speech person who they who could give you some guidance. And you can sneak moments of practice into your daily activities, not really having to sit down. So my final message is that it takes a team. The parents and family and friends are going to work with therapists and the doctors and the teachers in the community. And, and one final important point is that even when the child becomes more verbal and is easier to understand, that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. So don't be discouraged if the next thing is, well, we need to strengthen language a little bit more, or we need to strengthen, strengthen other aspects of communication, because speaking clearly is not the only thing we're looking for. Again, we're looking for overall communication. And so hopefully that leaves us enough time to answer a few questions. Um, Dr. Apologize Stuckle, for speaking. Uh, Dr. Stockel, Dr. Morgan, thank you so much. It really has been information packed. Whenever I hear talks uh, from speech pathologists at all, uh, I have to admit I'm, I'm impressed by what a complex topic it is and what a complex action it really is to produce speech and language as fluently as many people do. And I guess we see that fraying around the edges, so to speak, um, in children with neurodevelopmental disabilities, of course, in, in other individuals who have brain injuries from other causes and things like that. Dr. Morgan has been answering a lot of questions on the side in, in the Q&A. Uh, I want to address a, a, some of them very, very specific. I want to address a more general question uh, to Dr. Stuckel, if, if I can. How, how does a family know that they have a good speech pathologist working with them? Well, the first thing is they're willing to answer questions and admit when they don't know something um, to seek extra help to support them if they are uncertain. Um, and then I guess to educate themselves, to use um, sources like the Apraxia Kids has a parent portal to know good questions to ask. You know, what is the difference between motor-based therapy and articulation therapy? Can you explain it? And why are we doing this? So I, the number one thing is ask a lot of questions. And um, if you're not invited to be a part of the team, then that may not be a good fit. Understood. The, the two of you obviously are, are really experts in childhood apraxia of speech, and, and you focus on that in, in your research and teaching efforts, I know. In general, does a family need to find a speech pathologist who focuses on CAS? Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> The ASHA technical report indicates that the person best um, to provide intervention for a child with apraxia is someone with specialized um, expertise and knowledge. Great, right, 13. Great, thank you. There, there are some more specific questions mm -hmm. popping up. Um, focusing on specific genes, and I think Dr. Morgan's probably eager to answer them. We appreciate that very much. Uh, Dr. Stuckel, again, thank you very much for telling us also about 
the fact that there are studies going on to try to better understand the best approaches uh, to treating uh, C CAS. That, that's great to know. Um, uh, I, I want to mention, of course, that we do have actually a drug trial um, where for only individuals who have children and adolescents with a 16p11.2 deletion, uh, which has a really heavy focus uh, on speech uh, and speech outcomes. We're working with Dr. Morgan on that, and I can't really advertise for that here, but there is a website that is easy to find for anyone who wants to find out more information um, about that. Let, let me go back to some of the questions that we had previously uh, teed up. Um, and, and that have, have been been coming in. Uh, you, you touched on uh, AAC, doc, Dr. Stuckel. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything else to add about that? Is there, are there studies on, on new ways to use AAC or new types of AAC supports? Yes, it's, it's always um, changing. We've gone from simple iPad apps to more complex, uh, to more portable things. Um, there is no one size fits all, and there are so many options these days that um, there too, you might want to look for a specialist in augmentative communication if you're looking to uh, go with the speech output device so that you get something that truly fits the child and their needs. Hmm. Right. And, and a question possibly for, for each of you. Can a child have both a praxia of speech and other speech language disorders? And, and sort of related to that, can a child with a praxia of speech also have a praxia in other motor it, motor skills like upper upper extremity, lower extremity, and things like that? Yeah, I'd love I'll, I'd love to field that one for a moment. I'll give um, Dr. Stuckel a slight break. Um, absolutely, we often see a praxia and dysarthria. Um, co-occurring um, and I think it's not recognized enough. Ruth's been so great to work with. Uh, we've been producing a couple of talks together and she really made me even think about it in my own research. In my in my mind and my world, I'm so used to dysarthria coming together with apraxia. I probably don't say enough about that in our research papers actually. So I think it's great to have an opportunity to emphasize this and we really, we've done a good job of training therapists, speech therapists, I think more in apraxia and recent years but we do really need to come back and emphasize the dysarthria um, but also Paul absolutely that our speech motor system is one system very specific but typically for our children in particular who've had genetic conditions um, we do see a co-occurring fine motor praxis talent and also often a more gross um, motor apraxia. So sometimes that's also called developmental coordination disorder, depending who you see. So a psychologist uses a DSM-5 um, and their specific criteria and, and developmental coordination disorder is part of that, whereas an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist might say it's, it's motor apraxia or a fine motor difficulties or gross motor difficulties. But typically it's this challenge of planning and programming movement. So we see challenges learning to ride a bike you know, it's always these movements that require quite specific learning and that then only through a lot of repetition, just like what, what Ruth was talking about, we need a lot of repetition um, for getting speech movements automatised and the same for learning to ride a bike, that these are things we do and then we don't think about it anymore. It's become automatic, but it's really, um, you have to make that learning so explicit until you get the implicit learning happening. So yeah, it's really important to recognize that there's a whole body praxis for many children um, that occurs in getting that OT and physio support as well. But it's sort of, I think it's really nice for families to sometimes really understand that, that it's, that, that it helps them with recognizing that it's an underlying planning programming difficulty so that the types of therapy you need to apply do need to be very specific. Um, uh, and, and then once people sort of understand that, I think it is easier to know the types of therapies they, they need to access. Mm. Great. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Dr. Stockland, anything to add to that? That was a lovely answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, it has been a really lovely session all, all together. And I really want to thank you, Dr. Stockland, Dr. Morgan, so very much for sharing all your expertise with us. Um, Thank you as well for everybody who's attended for, for the stimulating questions uh, that you have been posting. 
Uh, I just want to say the number of people asked about the uh, recording of this webinar. Yes, it is being recorded uh, and it will be posted by the end of the month. I'm going to ask someone behind the scenes if they can maybe uh, post in the Q&A or, or speak up on exactly how best to find it on the Simon Searchlight website uh, or if it will be somewhere else. That is correct. So if you go to simonsearchlight.org, you will see it on the homepage and we also will post it on our YouTube channel. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just end by saying that if there's anything else, uh, anything else more that you want to learn about Simon Searchlight, about our registry, how uh, you can get involved, uh, please just visit the website simonsearchlight.org. Uh, you can also email coordinator at simonsearchlight.org. Uh, our genetic counselors would be happy to address any specific questions that you may have about your child's genetic testing report or result. Um, and uh, if you have any other general questions about Searchlight, please let us know. So thank you again, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Stucco, and, and to everybody in attendance. We've really learned a lot today. Thank you. Very kind. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yes.